Welcome our next two panelists who are going to address harnessing natural resources uh, for a better tomorrow. And I am very pleased to have with us today Dr. Tai Ping Fan, who is the Secretary General of GPTCM Research Association and the head of the Angiogenesis and Chinese Medicine Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and also joining him is Dr. Bifin Nair, Professor and Dean of the School of Biotechnology at Amrita University. Please give them a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, it gave me great pleasure to be here sharing with you what uh, Bipin and I have you know, been planning to do for the last year, and we'll get on with it. Uh, for this presentation, I've chosen a title, uh, Health and Healing Through uh, evidence-based application of traditional medicine. Uh, and I hope by the end of uh, this session, um, we would agree that uh, taking a magic bullet pill is not an option. Uh, we actually have an, it's actually an option. We actually have other, way, other things which would maintain your health in the future. And I'm reminded by Alma's comment today that we should all plant a tree uh, and I think we can all plant a herb, uh, and that will be also use, very, very useful. So that's my email address, and the uh, next slide shows immediately uh, what faces us globally. You can see that the number one killer remain cardiovascular diseases, and if you can look at cardiovascular and stroke, and also the ischemic heart diseases, it actually is an amazing number there. It's an alarming number, it's not amazing at all, it's an alarming number. And so what I'm going to talk to you about later is about how to control heart disease. And by way of uh, diabetes and obesity, those two are very, very important diseases that we have to consider. Uh, so a few words about drug discovery today. And drug companies are working very hard to discover new drugs. But there's a problem here. They actually are now facing a bottleneck. They spend a lot of money, manpower, but they are getting disproportional returns in terms of drug, single drug entities coming out onto the market. Let's consider why that's the case. I can see here that you might have an idea about our target. Now we know the human genome, we only have 23,000 genes in all of us. So it's relatively easy to find a target that you want to uh, work on. It's probably development, a lot of chemistry, robots, and cell culture, animal studies, and so that, that go to, to uh, development. And as long as it's safe, using animals like uh, rodents and also hopefully uh, dogs and not really uh, monkeys, and then it's safe. Then we go to phase one clinical trials. And by this time, one is hoping that you can go to phase two, phase three, and it's all safe, by that time you can register, and, you can, and the a drug company is very pleased, and they can register the product, and they can make money. They start to recoup what they've invested in. But what they didn't know, or what they didn't used to know, is actually something called pharmacovigilance, which is now very important, followed by post-marketing surveillance, and also a possible lawsuit. A company, uh, I'm sure you heard of Merck, actually was sued for 250 million dollars by a widow whose husband died of a heart attack while taking a drug for his arthritis. And that is actually quite alarming. So this actually shows quite clearly why drug development is actually takes long, 10 to 15 years typically, it takes a lot of money, 1,000 uh, US, uh, 1,000 million US dollars. And even when you actually got to that stage of discovery, imagine you're actually going through seven million chemical entities and go through a funnel, seven million, and eventually end up with a one drug. And what I'm showing you here is one to 10 or 5% chance of success for any kinds of drugs. And that actually is due to the fact you screen a lot of compounds out. By the time you come to phase one clinical trial, you hope for the best, but then you only got 5% success rate. And that is not quite a bitter uh, pill to swallow. So I would like to, uh, I would like to submit to you 
that although traditional, Chinese, uh, traditional medicine actually take a long time to develop, typically thousands of years, uh, but they might cause a lot less. The reason being we are doing reverse pharmacology because we know some of these ancient remedies have been tried out in man and woman and then they have proven to be uh, safe. Those unsafe ones, dangerous ones, actually have been, uh, we don't use them anymore. So chances are we can actually go back to nature uh, using natural product, we might come up with a winner. I would like to actually show you how that can be done. And the reason being natural product you can see here have advantage against synthetic compounds we take in the morning, like aspirin or paracetamol. You can see natural products actually are often more soluble. They're also more favorable, they have favorable range of physiological, physical chemical properties, and they also have, they deploy active transport within our gut cells, so their absorption and their metabolism uh, is actually guaranteed. You can see also they have privileged chemical structures which the body cell can recognize, not like pure compound that we invent in a laboratory. This product actually coming from nature. And so there is actually the advantages. Another thing to recognize is so you can see here in the 1981 to 2007, more, almost 70% of the new drugs, new chemical entities that you are natural product derived or natural product uh, inspired. In other words, traditional medicine can be developed into at least four different things. First of all, functional food or dietary supplements botanical drugs as in the United States, and also phytopharmaceuticals. So I think the future is quite bright, I would think. Now, so the American Journal of Science, uh, actually AAAS, uh, actually contacted me about three years ago, wanting me to uh, help them to edit a special supplement on traditional medicine. And it took three years to complete. The first issue came out uh, last December, and this is it. And you can see here, this is actually the art and science of traditional medicine. Part one meaning is a TCM today, a case for integration. That's why we're here today. I can see probably in 10 years' time, we might actually have integrated medicine instead of just integrative medicine. And the part two came out in January this year, and there we actually explored the possibility of using multidisciplinary approaches to understand what we are dealing with, herbal medicine. Part three will be coming out October the 23rd, and that will cover, amongst other things, Ayurvedic and also other traditional medicines. So even from the Middle East, Africa, uh, and also uh, Europe, and also uh, the Americas. So you can see this is actually endorsed by uh, Director General Margaret Chen of the World Health Organization, and she supported integration and modernization of traditional medicine of many kinds. And uh, Alan actually also endorsed that to say that we actually have now have the latest technology we actually have can to re revisit what we've been missing since the Industrial Revolution when we all take well, after that, we all take wild pills. And I have, I've been lucky to have an international editorial board represented by the National he uh, Institute of Health and also in the Netherlands, the TNOPG, and also, also a group of collaborators in Beijing, in Hong Kong, and Macau. So a few words about traditional medicine strategy, actually uh, envisioned by the World Health Organization for the 10 years, starting 2014. You can see here, it was so traditional medicine had been defined very, very clearly what it is. It's actually knowledge, the skills, and practices based on theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures, which is different from the medicine that we take, uh, from, uh, the tablet we take uh, uh, from bottles. And the idea is actually to prevent, to diagnose, and also the idea is actually health care instead of treating diseases really because this is actually used you can see it's quite clear it's cover a variety of therapy and practices and used for thousands of years particularly as a primary care health care at community level this is what we've been discussing all day today at community level we actually uh, different things we're talking about prediction of landslide we're talking about variety and actually you can see that since 1990 the use has a surge and it's now we know it's used by 70% of the world's population, which is quite 
interesting. I, I didn't know that many people use traditional medicine, but there you are. These are statistics from the World Health Organization. And so the, well, the, the WHO came up with three objectives in the next 10 years, what we're going to do. You can see, I'm going to not read it for you here because I'm actually at a slight disadvantage than you are. You're sitting from, I can't, I have to twist my, back, my neck here. I'm sorry about that. But you can see quite clearly, oh, I can actually, thank you. I, I'm going to read. So you can build the knowledge base for active management of traditional complementary medicine through appropriate national policies. Policy is so important because in many countries, like this traditional medicine can be used far away from its uh, place of origin. And how do the, the country where these uh, herbs are being found, say the herb is actually, uh, this formulation developed in India and now it's found its way to St. Petersburg in, in, in Russia. How do they know what it is? How can they control and control it. So it's very important to do that. You have to strengthen the quality, assurance, safety, uh, proper use, effectiveness, and so on and so forth. Number three, to promote, to promote universal health coverage, we're going to promote the national health services of various countries to actually ab absorb this. So a patient can actually claim the life insurance or health insurance through that. At the moment, this doesn't happen in many countries. And, and actually, this is interesting. The red line shows that the European Union has already started this line of work, and I'll, as I'll explain to you in a minute. You can see here, 20, 2009, the EU actually made a very brave decision to spend, no, no, well, actually, it's quite a sum of money, about 1 million euro, but that's not to do research, but to gather around it a group of experts who can advise and, and actually discuss among themselves what we can do in terms of validating and making good, uh, good practices of traditional medicine. You can see here we actually have 15 European uh, member states and also e uh, 11 non-European participating countries including the United States, uh, Canada, and Korea, uh, and Russia. You can see that is, we have 100 uh, 110 institutions and companies. So that I will submit to you. This actually will form a platform that any kind of traditional medicine can be uh, studied. So we, are, we actually, so I'll just illustrate to you what we have done. And these are the eight work packages. First of all, we have to be sure about quality control or quality assurance. And that was led by the Kew Garden in the United Kingdom. And extraction technology, why do we sometimes use more than one herbs? We have mixture or mixtures, typically in oriental medicine. And how do we extract them properly so that we are only getting the active principles and not the toxic ones? And we also we actually have to think about the toxicology aspect or safety aspect. And also we actually have genomic uh, research on to the in vitro the cell studies and whole body studies and also involving clinical studies. And regulatory framework is so important because we need to know we have a harmonization and collaboration amongst countries in the globe and that I uh, happen to be in charge of. And we also look at the functional genomics of acupuncture. Next one shows you uh, a few uh, snap, uh, snapshot of what we have achieved over the last uh, five years. You can see here, this is something called herbal genomics. I'm sure when you go shopping, you as you come out of the shopping and, the, and you see uh, to the scan and you're just making sound as you go through and there's a beep, beep and that is barcode. The, f the product we are buying from the supermarket. Likewise, we have DNA barcoding for herbs, which is so important so they avoid adulteration or misuse of herbs that can be, have dangerous consequences. In, in Europe, in, in Belgium, about 10 years ago, one herb has been misused and that caused, uh, uh, they, they, they caused the uh, fatal, fatality of uh, ladies who went for their slimming regime, they actually use the wrong herb. And they thought it's the same, but actually it's not the same. So I think, and on the basis of that, actually you can actually have mutation library, you can actually, uh, tissue culture, we also can see the genetic transformation, what that would do. This is all technology available at hand in European countries and also this collaboration is done in, uh, with China. So I'm sure we'd like to invite our host institution 
uh, a major universe to join in. And you can see that we can actually build a model herbal platform. We can even consider synthetic biology. We can actually use even tobacco, uh, tobacco leaves to actually generate the compounds we really want, secondary metabolize, and also in, because we are actually, deforestation is actually, uh, and how do we, Conserve. We, how do we have sustainable supply of herbs? We can cultivate them in greenhouse as well. So this is actually a major achievement. Secondly, it's about holistic approach to uh, quality control, if you like, or quality assurance. And water is, uh, we discussed, of course, later on, Bipin with his theory about, uh, uh, earlier we talked about sanitation. We also talked about, we heard about uh, how nanotechnology can use to purify water. And this is actually the case in point. If we don't have good supply of water, all this is to, to be in vain. And in certain countries, actually, uh, the, the herbs or actually the rice would actually be heavily contaminated with arsenic or pesticides and other things. And actually, can that herb be used? Of course not. So that's a major problem we actually have. The, so you can see technologies now being that you have biological analysis, bioresponse, fingerprint, metabolic fingerprints, and so on and so forth. This is all available at the moment. And how do we actually make sure some is of good quality, uh, is superior quality or inferior quality, or actually is a uh, genuine article or is a fake article, we have that authentication. So this is all being done uh, using macro and micro scopic identification. This is called uh, pharmacognosy, which is a dying art. And we must rescue that. And those TLC analysis and the mask bag and so on and so forth. This is all available. There's nothing uh, uh, which is uh, not achievable. And I'll just give you one example. This is a this is her most people would know. Uh, it's called ginseng. And sometimes you actually have a ginseng drink, go to the supermarket and have a ginseng drink or ginseng tablet. If you go to Korea or Korea friend come to you, they give you you know, Korean ginseng. And this is a, an interesting stu uh, study we actually carried out a few years ago. We look at the, uh, the composition of two uh, of the main ginsengs are RG1 and RB1. They are basically phytosteroids. They are very similar to the steroids that we carry in our bloodstream every day, steroids. But these are phytosteroids specifically for the, uh, in the plants. And actually, we actually uh, look at the American ginseng and, and, and compare that with the, uh, you can see here, RG1 highlighted in red and RB1 highlighted in green. You can see American ginseng, interestingly, usually is 20 to 1 ratio, or maybe 13 to 1, uh, depending on batteries. Whereas the oriental ginseng actually is 1 to 1 ratio. So be very, very careful what you buy and what you drink. If you actually have a certain composition, uh, you shouldn't be drinking one of these if you actually want to uh, control tumor metastasis, this is probably a good one because RB1 we know it is anti-angiogenesis also is, is can actually inhibit tumor metastasis. So you can see that by simply doing this experiment, which took about uh, one and a half years really, and we actually have shown that actually the effect of ginseng and so vascular pathology actually is dependent on the two opposing active in, in, ingredients found in the shape of RG1 and RB1. But RB1 is actually metabolized very quickly to something like RG3. So what we can see now is a geographic variations in how these plants uh, are, are developed and so on and so forth. And toxicology. And we're all worried about toxicology. We actually usually use animals in large numbers and feed them uh, what we call LD50, lethal dose 50, and effective dose 50. That is so cruel to do the animals. You actually feed them large amount of chemicals, wait until 50% of them died. And that's your LD50 over ED50, and that is therapeutic index. But with there are other ways now. We have developed collectively that... Uh, uh, sorry, with data collectively an in vitro 3D tissue culture which is uh, mimicking the in vivo cell environment and not only one cell type but multiple cell types so they can, we can mimic it, we can also have an organ on the chip 
models, which is not available to us. We could also consider herbal matrix, in fact, because uh, sometimes herbs are used not alone, but in, in combination. That's very important. So we use chemogenomics to despise, device, decipher that. We also have in situ models. So that is preclinical. But how about when you go to the clinic? You have pharmacovigilance and also clinical assessment or the herbal medicine. We need to actually have non-invasive urinary metabolic metabolomics, sorry about that, and that actually would tell us, uh, give us a warning shot, just like uh, we heard earlier about the landslide warning, and this actually give us warning what is, what is happening to these patients, and we also have to consider complex inter, uh, chemical interaction be between plants. Right, I would like to change the gear, if I may. This is actually coming to disease. So far, we discover how drug can be discovered, uh, extraction technology, and so on and so forth. I would like to focus on, very quickly, on a common denominator of many, many diseases. And this denominator is called angiogenesis. Uh, when our body cells actually lack oxygen, a signal comes up, it's called HIF-1 alpha, hypoxia inducible factor, and along with inflammatory, inflammatory uh, factors and platelets, which actually contain growth factor, they release angiogenic factors. Angiogenesis means formation of new blood vessels, and when these factors are transported to endothelial cells, which line any blood vessels in our body, they would respond very, very quickly, and then they begin to migrate, they begin to form, proliferate, and begin to form tubes, all because of this signal transduction, because this is actually the chemicals are activating the intracellular signaling pathway to go about migrating, uh, proliferating, and forming tubes. And that tube is not mature until another cell will come along here. This is called parasite. And once a parasite actually has contact with this new blood vessel, blood begins to flow. But now we also discover there's another cell which is the homing. These are in our bloodstream. You heard of her stem cells? Yeah? And this is another stem cell. It's called endothelial progenitor cells. They're just like fire engines or ambulances. They're, they actually go around the street, and when they discover there's something they, they are necessary, they'll actually come to that side very quickly. And you can see here many, many diseases, including stroke and so actually have this common denominator. And so I'd like to subject, you know, I propose to you, this is actually uh, any moment in time in a bloodstream, uh, these factors are in balance. So we don't have angiogenesis. Uh, we don't have excessive angio. And the reason being, you can see here, angiogenesis in health only happens in three uh, situations. One is uh, during the menstrual cycle of ladies. In men, endothelials only, 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 endothelial cells only divide once every three years. In ladies, once every 30 days because on a menstrual cycle that is important to you know, because that the endometrium need to be prepared for ovulation and also implant and fertilization implantation that is where we spend our life in, in our, our early life in our mother's womb that's that probably was me you can see here these are fetus and that's growing because and angiogenesis is allowing my my brain to be uh, uh, to grow and uh, like, like. and so this is angiogenesis in physiology and also during wound healing angiogenesis would be going to into place and all other types of angiogenesis are pathological you can see here insufficient angiogenesis uh, these days as I said earlier uh, Myocardial infarction or high blood pressure is actually on the increase, cardiovascular, and that is due to the, the, these blood vessels being actually clogged up with fat. And that you can see downstream, the blood is not going to flow, and so downstream here you see the blackened uh, part of muscle, and that is called ischemic tissue here. If not treated, that becomes fibrotic, and that will actually cause heart attack. So that actually is insufficient uh, angiogenesis, also peptic ulceration, and if you like, another one is actually diabetic foot, which would lead to amputation if not treated. So in this situation, we need a direction, you know, we need a localized treatment of this to stimulate angiogenesis. How about other situations when you have tumor growth? And this is, a, this is to remember, uh, to pay homage to the discoverer of angiogenesis, Judah Folkman, uh, who actually pioneered this uh, area of angiogenesis. He actually suggested that uh, he showed quite clearly cancer cells require angiogenesis to survive, to grow, and to metastasize. Because you can see here, this is how cancer cells grow, because by attracting new blood vessels, so it can actually be, bring nutrients and oxygen, and later on, they will actually use the vascular network to go to other parts of the body. 
patients do not die of their skin cancer. They will die of metastasis, lung cancer, and liver cancer. So I think it's important to realize that. Angiotherapy, what are we dealing with here for? Coronary artery heart disease, stroke on the one hand, cancer, op um, retinopathy, obesity on the other hand. So this is actually coming uh, sooner than you think. Next one, uh, retinopathy. You can see here, this is a healthy eye, and this is a patient with uh, diabetic retinopathy. You can see a lot of new blood vessels are growing here, and these are actually punctate. They are, uh, they are immature, so they can actually rupture uh, from occasionally, and that can cause blindness. And you can see here, statistically, it used to be diabetes or retinopathy is usually uh, age of, you know, this is to a disease of the aged, probably 50 plus. But you can see the patient demographic actually come to towards the 20s. So there's a major, major problem here. So we have to bear that in mind. Each year, you know, 10,000 people lost their sight because of diabetes. Uh, first, fortunately, in Chengdu, China, um, Professor Duan and I were developing a three-hair formulation for retinopathy. And if anybody is interested, later on we can talk about it. This is a herbal formulation which is used for in diabetes, uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, very quickly, endometriosis, I have no time for them. This is another problem of excessive angiogenesis. A lot of ladies are suffering in silence. They, don't, they need not do that. So, and this is another case. Uh, I don't know what actually it should be. David, uh, then, and David now, I don't know why he came out this way. Uh, this is David when he was uh, created by Michelangelo, very you know, beautiful specimen, but when he migrated to New York or Cambridge or elsewhere, and this is what he gets. Uh, thank you very much. Time up. And so very quickly, this is actually due to a lot of fat there. And if I can quickly show you, this is a problem. This is a lot of fat. And that actually are perfused by blood, as you can see here. For you, if you gain one pound of fat, you gain seven miles of vasculature. But fortunately, if you actually reduce one pound of weight, you, these blood vessels will be resolved. And so this is quite, quite interesting. Very quickly, we actually, I don't think I'll just, this is just to say to you, this is uh, a, a, a drug which is under clinical trial at the moment uh, for angina, and we actually have deciphered, we actually discover how it works. And we actually think that if we, we discovered active ingredients or IDHP in the bloodstream, and so then we actually use this methodology to discover new compounds. And this has actually been shown to be effective. I can show you very quickly. And this actually, we have patented these 200 compounds in 40 countries and regions. We're not doing preclinical studies, and the chances are good because these actually are new compounds because these are actually, although they come from nature, the, the act of putting, linking two chemicals together, that is actually invention. So what we have done is very quickly just show you what DBZ does. This is an animal which has just suffered from terminal illness, so to speak. Uh, these are animals called apple E mice. Or they know they are all right, but if you feed them a high fat diet, they quickly develop atherosclerosis. You can see here, this is all blocked up here. Right? But then if you give them DVZ orally, 20 milligram per kilogram, you can see the fat dissolved. And by the time you use 40 milligram per kilogram, you can actually uh, claim the new blood vessels here. And so that is Chinese medicine, but I would like to pay homage uh, to our main host, which is Ayurvedic. We don't know much about that, but you can see by, uh, by later this year, October 23rd, we're going to have at least two features on Ayurvedic, and we're using a variety of methodologies, chemogenomics and so on and so forth, to decipher how this ancient wisdom uh, has worked. And finally, how about harnessing natural resources from within? What I've talked about is from outside, from plant sources or animal sources or minerals. How about from within? Imagine... Sorry, in two, two minutes. You uh, can see here that we humans have 23, you know, 10 to the 13 cells in our body, but we are overwhelmed by the number of microbes in our body, in our gut. We have 10 times of them. So one of us to 10 of them, uh, although they weigh much less, their genome is, uh, we have 23,000 genes but the microbes have at least one million genes. So each day, are we talking to them or what? There's a crosstalk between us and them. 
So it is important for us to make good, uh, harness these inner resources because bacteria are of two, three kinds. One are pathological, one are healthy, and one are non-committed. So we want to use that. So I'll leave this slide. You know, if you are interested, email me. I'll give you the complete slide. And acupuncture, and very quickly, before you, you know, throw me out of here, acupuncture is actually uh, from within because we're releasing chemicals from our body like endorphin, when you get happy, when you get married, when you have your first child, you get happy, and that is endorphin. And also now we know it can be used not only for pain control, but it can be used for stroke, hypertension, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. This is the answer, I need You have an iPad, your iBook, this is I need You can actually go to the site of EchoPoint and you can monitor what's happening. And then this is nanotechnology, which I'd like to talk to our collaborators here. Okay. And finally, this is, a, I'd like to, this is from within. You use meditation, you use yoga, and how cool is that? 320, 35,000 people all doing one thing. And with that note, thank you very much. <laughs>